Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this year's first event with Arabic story, poetry and story in translation workshops, public events. Tonight we have Iraqi and Kurdish author and activist Haifa Zengana with us, who will read a little bit from her work and talk about her engagement with women and women's issues in her writings, and also her work with women prisoners in Palestine and in Tunis. But before we let her, right, take the center stage, let me introduce some of her works to you. Um, she's a novelist. She has written three or two novels, depending on what, how you look at her works. Um, the first one is Dreaming of Baghdad, which came out in 2002. And this one is based on her memoirs of her prison days. Um, and the early pieces came out in Al-Ikhtirab Al-Adabi, a literary journal published by Iraqis in exile in London and in different chapters in 1980s and 90s. And these were selected by Paul Hammond and translated into English um, under the title Through the Vast Halls of Memory in 1991. And later, the Arabic version appeared as Fi Arwiqat al-Dhakira. In addition, she has three, uh, four collections of short stories, um, 1996, Beit al The House of Ants, 1997, Abad min Manara, Beyond What Eyes Can See, 1999, Thamata Akhir, There's Such Other, There Is Such a Thing as the Other, and 2007, Package Life, Hayat Mu'allaba. In addition, she has written right, two novels, 2001, Nisa ala Safar, Women on a Journey, which appeared in English, uh, translated by Judith, Judy Cumberbatch in 2007, and another one, Mafatih Medina, Keys to a City, 2002. She also writes for Al Quds Al Arabi, Arabic newspaper, and The Guardian, frequently and often. But more recently, she has been working with women prisoners, uh, Palestinian women prisoners, and she has led writing workshops with them through which they converted or wrote or translated their experiences into short pieces. So the pieces written by Palestinian women prisoners appeared in a book, Hafla Li in 2007, and in English is Party for Tha'ira. And these are in the process of being translated into English. But this year, more recently, right, uh, her work with Tunisian women prisoners appeared under the title Dafatir and Milh, Notebooks of Salt or Salt Notebooks. And we don't, you don't have a translator. It's been translated. It's been translated. Hasn't been it hasn't been published yet, right? But of course, right, um, uh, Haifa is a long time. Um, activist and she engages with women's issues. So she has written a history of women activists in Iraq and the book is called City of Widows, an Iraqi Women's Account of War and Resistance, which appeared in 2007. So please help me welcome Haifa Zangana. Thank you. So we have a minute, an hour, and I think what Haifa will do is start by reading from um, her memoirs. Okay. Some in Arabic and some in English, and then we'll just, and then we'll go on right. to talk and talk about okay. right. prison literature. Yeah, it's, uh, well, thank you very much for being here. It's, uh, it's been such a lovely three hours, I mean two, and this is the third hour. This is uh, the fourth, by the way. Is it the fourth? Yes, oh yes. my God, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you're having fun, so it's... <laughs> uh, I'm, I, I've chosen uh, one page to read from Fi Arwaqat al dhakira which was published originally under the title of uh, Through Vast Holds of Memory. But then when it was reprinted uh, by the Feminist Press, uh, they chose in another title, Dreaming of Baghdad. And this is a rather strange book because it seems like, uh, I think I had like three or four translations of it until now. So whenever it's being published again, there is a new translation. Though I mean the Arabic text is the same. 
so I don't know what that, uh, if it makes sense about the, how good is translation or not good or whatever. I, I lost, I mean, track of uh, comparing the, the original text and uh, other than that. Uh, but the, f the first translation was, which was published actually in Paris, uh, was this one through Fast Falls of Memory. And I worked on that one with the poet. I did the draft, draft uh, translation and with my poor English altogether. But there was a poet, Paul Hammond, who did very admirable job of doing it. We worked together on it. So it's one way of translating the uh, thing. Uh, this is, uh, I mean, is it a novel or is it a memoir? I mean, uh, one should think, uh, likes to say it is a memoir, and I, I thought it's a, a novel for one reason. Uh, because I didn't trust my memory. It was written like uh, 10 years after my release from prison, and I was worried that maybe I'm not really being I'm not going to be loyal uh, to the others, other people who were either arrested or they been killed, hanged uh, with me. And being the survivor is not something to be proud of when your comrade is being killed. Uh, so, and also it gave me the freedom, probably to escape responsibility. I don't know. I mean, there are things I couldn't remember, things I remembered. And I was worried that I might present myself as the hero while the rest are not, or I am a victim, the rest are not. Uh, thinking about all this, and it took me years to write it. And it's such a small book, like uh, it's not a huge book. Some of the publisher refused to publish it because it was too small as a novel, as small as a memoir or whatever, it's until it became uh, considered to be a kind of classic in Arab women, though I am Kurd, but I am an Arab because I'm living in Arab country, and uh, classic of women writing about prison. Uh, so it is based on my own uh, memoir. Uh, and the continuity of the work which I've been doing in the last four years, I mean the work, the kind of work I'm doing the last four years, it is the continuity of that, which I started in the late 80s. So decades passed, but I went back to what I started uh, then. Uh, the new uh, editions, and it was also uh, reprinted, the new editions, it was in India and other places, uh, not just uh, in America and here. Anyway, I read uh, a bit of a uh, couple, of, couple of pages from this and because I, I would like to take you to my journey after that with the Palestinian women and with the Tunisian women who've been uh, also imprisoned for political reasons. So I'm, I'm talking specifically about not just ordinary prisoners but political prisoners and, uh, in the Arab world. Uh, this chapter in the book is called Baghdad, and do I should read the Arabic first or the English? What do you want? Do, what do you prefer? It's a little bit of Arabic or no? Yeah. A little bit of Arabic, Arabic please. Yeah. Okay. Just a little bit. Just a bit. Well, I'll, I'll read the, in, in Arabic. I'll, uh, I'm going to... By the way, we were talking about uh, uh, traveler lit uh, literature to start with. And one of the chapters in this book is, I haven't traveled to see new places. So it's about being forced to travel, forced to leave. It's about the places I kept talking about or writing about many, many uh, years after. And. I could have started, right. This is about Baghdad, I called it. Here, city number one, I gave it. I, I couldn't really bring myself to say what's happening here 
is actually related to Baghdad because the word just Baghdad uh, really it, it does um, a passionate, I mean, a wonderful word, which I, I didn't bring myself to say it, that horrible things could happen in Baghdad. So I said, this is city number one. كنت في العشرين من عمري عارية وقفت وسط الغرفة يحيط بي أربعة رجال وصناديق كتبي والمنشورات ومكتب ضخم وآلات تسجيل وأريكة تمتد على طول أحد الجدران وصينية تحتوي بقايا بعض الطعام والستائر مزدلة أبدا الجالس خلف المكتب الضخم لم يقل الكثير كان متوسط القامة داكن البشرة يرتدي نظارات غامقة اللون ذهبية الإطار وبدلة غامقة اللون يحمل في يده مسبحة وزع نظراته عليها وعلي بالتساوي كما لو كان متحيرا إزاء مسألة خاصة جدا كان هو السيد المطلق لذلك القصر قصر النهاية That's the special place for political prisoners is, uh, The prison. ملما بكل ما يجري في أقبيته وغرفه العديدة يستقبل زواره لإلقاء نظراته المتفحصة عليهم قبل توزيعهم على الغرف الأخرى والانشغال الحكومة بتنظيف واجهة مبناها الإعلامي والمعارضة الرئيسية بالمساهمة في تلميع بضع آجرات طمعا في المساهمة بالحكم تمتع ذلك الرجل بحرية كاملة في الاعتقال والتعذيب والإعدام واختفى في دهاليز ذلك القصر آلاف الناس لمجرد رفع أصواتهم متذمرين بعد أربعة أعوام ظهرة يوم شديد القيظ عانى سيد القصر من الصيرورة ذاتها اعتقل وعذب وأعدم من قبل الحكومة ذاتها بس And then I ask, هل هناك إمكانية حدوث شيء يثير الضحك الآن? I was 20 years old. I stood in the middle of a room in front of four men. My boxes of books and pamphlets, a huge desk, recording machines, and a sofa were against one of the wall. Leftovers of a meal remained on a tray. The man sitting behind the desk did not say much. His name was Nazim Qzar, and he was the head of the Iraqi secret intelligence. He was of medium height with dark skin and wore sunglasses with gold rims. He had on a dark suit and held a rosary. He divided his attention equally between it and me, as if debating something. He was lord and master of Qasr al-Nihaya, the detention center for political prisoners in Iraq. He knew everything that took place within its four walls. He received visitors and delegated them to various rooms. While the government was maintaining its facade of civility and the Communist Party's main opposition was busy, polishing a few bricks in the hope of securing a couple of seats in the government. This man had absolute freedom in arresting, torturing and executing detainees in the labyrinth of that castle. Four years later, at noon on a hot, sunny day, he suffered the same fate. He was arrested tortured and executed by his own government. What was to become of me? One of them, one of the men, crawled around me and then touched me. As he did so, I could hear the laughter of the other men in the room. I was so scared. I had no time to be disgusted by the slimy hands touching my body. I looked at the curtains, the walls, the boxes of books, And as I smiled stupidly, the man hit me across the face, his coarse words swirling around my body. 
when he hit me on the head, lights danced in front of my eyes. I was pushed against the wall. The man who was so far had remained calm and silent, now moved for the first time and told his men to leave me alone. Approaching me, he pointed to my clothes and I quietly put them on. He told me to sit beside him and asked me softly, are you hungry? I want to go to the toilet. One of the men accompanied me to the toilet on the first floor, which was not an easy task as he had to stop me time and again and order me to face the wall as other prisoners filed by. After they had gone, there were drops of blood on the ground. I followed the man, the man to the first floor and he showed me to the toilet. No, it was just a room with a tap. I turned around confused. He said, what's the difference? Do what you want to do here. And he stood behind me. I urinated and returned with him to the hall. There, the master asked me to sit next to him and eat dinner. And now, I want you to tell me everything you know. He patted me on the shoulder tenderly as if we were friends. I hadn't seen, he was a friend I hadn't seen in a long time. And all he wanted was to hear my latest news. About what? It doesn't matter. Tell me about everything, anything. Remain silent for two days. Those had been my instructions. After that, people would go, get to know about my arrest. Meeting would be cancelled. Hiding places would be changed. Two days of silence. This was the lullaby I comforted myself with and a smile coursed through my shivering body. He stood up and said, it seems you are all alike. I thought you were an intellectual with nothing in common with those ignorant people. He left and I didn't see him again. Well, that was uh, the first couple of hours I, when I was arrested and uh, it goes on. But also, I mean, it's, uh, I hope I didn't depress you. It, uh, it's a lot of it. it uh, it's hard, what have you seen about moving on from uh, also the first city to the second city, uh, which was, I through, I mean, I moved from uh, Baghdad, I went to Syria. I worked there with the PLO uh, because I am originally a pharmacist. I, my degree is in pharmacy, and so I was the, the manager or who helped to establish the establish a medical uh, factory for the Palestine Liberation Organization at the time. And uh, we were thinking that we want to be uh, independent because we were worried then maybe one day the medicine will never be there and, uh, for the Palestinians, especially uh, for the camps in, uh, in Syria. Uh, and in Lebanon. So I was working there and we managed within one year actually to produce something like 11 uh, kind of medication focusing mainly on uh, children. We were worried about the kids that not to get it because with all these alliances, one day you are with the Soviet Union, the other day you are with China, the Arab country might just really stop supplying you with everything, so we were relying. And I worked with the engineering units uh, in Lebanon to even to work to design the machinery for producing tablets, liquid, and all the stuff there. Uh, so that was moving to, and then I, I had to move between the camps in Lebanon, between Syria and Lebanon, until I left uh, and came to London in 1976. Uh, where I was, I kept my link with the PLO uh, for a year and uh, a person who was uh, almost in charge of everything was assassinated in Paris at that time. And then I just uh, gave up and uh, carried on writing, painting, uh, everything, and producing books and carrying on. 
Anyway, I mean, uh, my writings mainly uh, it's about people's people in exile. People is like it's been described by uh, uh, who are really not managing. They are ala uh, al-atabe. It's on the threshold. Uh, people who cannot get. I mean, accept the fact that they are in different countries, so they are moving on, but also they, they are still carrying on the old country with themselves. They are there on the threshold standing most of the time, not being able to integrate uh, as they should do. And this being done, I mean, in, especially in women on a journey uh, between Baghdad and London, and in this book, I wrote about four women. Uh, this four women who were really, it's, uh, uh, they had a meeting one day, and they decided that they should meet once a month uh, just to be together, being Iraqis uh, from different parts of uh, the country. Uh, and they have to carry on. Is, uh, but they couldn't. Uh, in the end, at the end of the novel, we realized they never managed to meet again. It's only that once because they, their life took them various stations. I am very. I was very interested, as from the beginning of writing, with the role of memory. The, the memory of. Uh, people in exile, especially uh, in, in writing, even fiction. What is the role of the memory? How honest it is? How reliable is the memory? Do you really, uh, how, where do you draw the line is? So I, in, in part of this, this is because relying mostly on the memory is, I, I always go back to this uh, questioning of uh, the memory because of something happened also. Uh, writing about the past is a game the writer plays by fence with memory. She chases them, but they slip away and hide in the enigma of time and place, in the labyrinth of the present and the unconscious of dreams. Memories are too elusive to grasp as the truth. Some construct them, while others erase them. I sometimes becomes all, and everyone else is erased. Truth hides behind layers of colored clouds that filter it and allow only glimpses. The truth is covered, events camouflaged. The writer sees the past like looking at an old photograph. The photographer is the only one who can freeze memory in an instant. And the photograph belongs to that instant alone. It cannot go beyond that one moment. It shows nothing else. The photograph itself is without memory. At most, it can turn into a symbol or a sign at a junction. Who knows? One of those roads may lead to a secret memory covered in time. Memory is multi-layered. Its architecture varies according to the intentions of the career. It is the unwritten record of the past its only partner is forgetting. So this is actually, I, I was shocked to discover, discover one day, I was in Tunisia actually in the 80s, and uh, a friend of mine gave me a pile of newspapers, uh, Iraqi newspapers. At uh, the time I didn't see them before, and there was an ad into one of the papers, uh, looking some like we use it in, in the Arab country when someone disappears or someone is lost or something. We don't put it on the tree like losing a cat here or a dog or something, but uh, it's for uh, 
uh, people. So it's in the newspaper. We have a page so who's lost, who died, who's whatever. And uh, I saw this one about somebody who been lost. And suddenly it clicked in my mind that there was someone lost. In, in the time where we were at the struggle, we were fighting the regime. Someone who I didn't write about. And then, then the, the name came immediately to me. His name came to me. And I said, where, where is he? Why didn't I write about him? What's happened to him? It's, uh, it was like a complete cover up of the whole thing. He just disappeared. We went to the military base where we were based and he disappeared. And I didn't ask. So why didn't I ask? I started questioning the whole thing about, about how honest where we were at that time. Was he killed and buried in the base? And I didn't, did I know about it? Did I know the details? What about his parents and everything? Then it's something like a change completely uh, in myself and what we did and required me to go back and look at it in different way. All of it is thing. Uh, and that is what really, it's the background of all my writing, is how truthful we are. As, uh, do we record what's happening even when there is imagination? Is, uh, is the imagination free us using or claiming there is imagination? Or like what I've done instead of uh, a memoir, I've said this is a novel. Does it free us from responsibility? moral responsibility, legal responsibility, other things. So it's a lot of ethical questions going on and all. And that's, I, I worked on with Women on a Journey. Uh, it's about those four women from various political uh, parties. Four of them, they belong to different, one of them from uh, the Ba'athist, another one is a communist and all. But really it's, uh, but also there is a lot of things that really sh those women should be together but they couldn't they couldn't overcome their differences at all in the end my failure with those women is what led me years later to work with other women probably it's failure my failure to work with iraqi women so i worked with the palestinian and the tunisian uh, in palestine I've noticed, I went back as part of uh, the Palestine uh, festival, which is intended to break the silence and uh, uh, about Palestinians. The literary figures, they go there every year and taking to various cities and places and live as the Palestinians live, even if it's for just one week. But I extended my stay there and uh, I've noticed, because I noticed that in Palestine, despite the 60, 70 years of occupation, there are, I'm sure, I wouldn't exaggerate and say 10,000, but there are thousands of women who've been imprisoned uh, in Palestine. Yet, there isn't just one book, there was just one book written by women about the experience of prison, and that's Aisha Ode book, Thaman al Hurriya, is, uh, which is a fantastic book, brilliant. I mean, she, beautiful woman, when you meet her and uh, read her book. She wrote, at a later stage, she wrote another two books. Uh, so it's a brilliant start. Other than that, there wasn't any. So I, I was thinking, why not write, start to do it? and. Uh, I had some assistance there, people helped me. I ran the first workshop. So I had uh, not just women to start with. I had uh, seven women and two men. I think they were also ex Esra, because this is the term we use for Palestinians. They're not a prisoners. They are es Esra. And you said it's hostages? Um, captives? More captives. Captives. I prefer when we translate to use Esra. 
Asirat, like we introduce it to the, like Intifada. It's been introduced into English. So because of their unique situation, I think we shouldn't really say they are just prisoners. They are Asirat. A Muharrarat, they've been liberated, but they've not been liberated because of the kindness of the Israeli uh, government or uh, the occupation, but because they reached an agreement to release uh, this kind of part, exchange, exchange exactly. of uh, thing. Anyway, uh, some of the women were imprisoned for 10 years, others for five, uh, various ages of, I mean, starting from one of them was 19. Uh, so she is uh, called Zahra, Zahrat. Uh, Al-Asirat Zahrat, which is the young one, because she was arrested, I think, at the age of 16 or 17, 16. And uh, we had the two men, but uh, the second time I went there, a few months later, they were re-arrested. Because be, being released does not guarantee that you will remain released. So you can be rearrested again at any time. So the two men were rearrested. I was left with the woman, which is a good experience anyway, I mean. Uh, so I worked with seven women. One of them, uh, most of them, except for two, one of them is a well-known writer, uh, poet, Fryal uh, Ghazul, her name, but she didn't, she wasn't imprisoned. So she was just, she was interested in attending. And the other one uh, was uh, who just tried to write. She just started writing. So it went on, I mean, like most of them, they never written anything before. And we began the workshop. It took me like three workshops, three visits to Palestine, to Ramallah. And they were excellent because really, uh, I mean, it is so difficult for them to reach the place. It was like, but they struggled to come and to attend. And they thought uh, it could be like any other uh, NGO coming or someone coming, visiting them. And they just say, OK, it's nice, it's good. And they leave. and. The, but I, I was determined to publish it. I promised them to publish it as a book, which I did while I'm thinking. And this is the book. It's Hafla li Tha'ira, which is, I chosen, uh, it is a party for Tha'ira. And Tha'ira in Arabic is a revolutionary, is someone also. But also it's the name of the girl who was born in a prison, the baby, Tha'ira. And she spent two years in a prison with the mother, with her mother. Uh, and one of the, uh, stories or text there is uh, about her, all the women prisoners. They want to uh, organize a little party for her birthday and they, the magnificent little things they manage to collect and gather and how they organize it and the thing. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have really brought some of the the English translation, because I got some of it, but I didn't. I can read a bit of Arabic, if you like, uh, one of the short texts. The idea was to write, I mean, the main uh, idea of the whole workshop, this one and the Tunisian, is to encourage those women who are exceptional women in their struggle, in their way of life, in their continuous struggle, daily struggle in their countries is to write their own stories, to write their own experience, not to be uh, a topic that other people write about them. And I think I'm quoting this from Mahmoud Darwish. He said, We're not going to be something to be written about, as if we don't exist. We do exist. And women often complain that they are really not heard, not listened to. So also it's an encouragement. Come on, you have a voice. Let's reach it. It's your voice. You write it, use it. And the fear of the language, we had to break that taboo about the language. 
because of the Arabic language is the classical Arabic. There is always this wall between you and what you write. You speak Arabic, but you cannot write in the classical Arabic. How you break that? We reached, I, my encouragement or the idea is put down on paper anything and we'll work on it. So them themselves, it's like what we've seen in the workshop, they worked as groups, they worked together, and also they were acting like a writer and a critic at the same time. They were re started to develop this ability of picking things up and knowing what is and what is, and through exercises we worked on various issues. And the other point which we really focused on is, come on, people are really, uh, how many books about tortures they can read or they can listen, like I've been torturing you today and reading some of my things. Uh, it's, it's unfair, really, not fair. I mean, how many books can you read about the sin? Let's try to grasp those human moments and presenting it in artistic way and uh, different techniques used to write it about, even about torture. Let's not exactly do this and that. Uh, if you want to put your testimony, it's not about also, and your voice, it's not about I being arrested on this date and being released on that, it's not. Though they are very important and it's being done in many places. It's being recorded, your testimonies. Let's write something different. And they managed it. Beautiful, beautiful, if I may say, I saw myself, <laughs> a beautiful text uh, thing. And I would like to read one page uh, of it. It's, uh, it's, it's in Arabic, but uh, I, I'm so proud of, uh, proud of them, anyway. <laughs> it's, uh, this has been written by Mayil Hussein, and she, is, uh, she spent 10 years in prison. Uh, but also her husband disappeared. So she kept going back to that issue about her husband disappeared a long time ago and she hasn't seen him. As, but she's, this is the last piece I put in the book because I thought this can really, uh, there is some, something different. Anyway, قطرة قطرة ينزل المطر تلمس قطرات المطر وجهي لا أمسحها أريدها أن تبقى قليلا قبل أن تتدحرج متكومة على الأرض أستنشق رائحتها كم هي زكية رائحة التراب المبتل بالمطر تلعب الذاكرة لعبتها فتأخذني إلى أيام مضت الساعة التاسعة صباحا موعد خروج البنات إلى الفورة الفورة هي ساحة السجن ساحة من الصعب تحديد شكلها تطل غرف المعتقل المكون من طابقين عليها فيها مدرج من ثلاث درجات وسلم جانبي في علاه بوابة مغلقة هناك في تلك الزاوية غرفة المراقبة حيث تجلس السجانة المناوبة لتراقبنا وترصد حركاتنا كأنها كاميرة مراقبة لا يرف لها جفن أعلى الساحة سياج وشبك هل وضعت ليمنعونا من التحليق أم لمنع أشعة الشمس من الوصول إلينا بدأت السجانة بفتح الأبواب ولكن لم يخرج أحد فقد كان المطر شديدا في الخارج سمعت صوت خطوات الثقيلة تصل غرفتنا وصوت المفاتيح ويتحاول إدخالها في ثقب الباب قالت إحدى الأخوات وقد لفت نفسها بغطاء السرير الذي لا يكاد يدفئها لا 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 تخرجي ألا ترين المطر أجبت أنا خارجة لأنها تمطر في تلك اللحظة فتحت السجانة النحيل الباب ووقفت تتفحصنا بخبث ولسان حالها يقول لست أنا من يحرمكم من الخروج إنه المطر خرجت لم يكن في الساحة سواية تسارعت قطرات المطر بالنزول من بين فتحات الشبك لامست تلك القطرات الندية روحي قبل أن تبلل جسدي وبدأت الورود تتفتح بداخلي اشتد هطول المطر بدأت بالركض لأجد نفسي خارج حدود المكان والزمان 
بسطت يدي فأصبحت مثل طائر يحلق في السماء تدفق الأمل من قلبي كالشلال ليزيل كل همومي انتبهت إلى وقع خطوات ورائي فإذا بكل الأخوات قد خرجنا وبدأنا يركضنا معي حلقنا عاليا بفرحنا وبشوقنا الطفولي للعب تحررنا من المكان المغلق أصبحنا أكثر حرية من السجانة التي وقفت تراقبنا من خلف زجاج غرفتها لعلها كانت تتساءل كيف استطعنا أن يكن بهذا القدر من الحرية ألسنا محكومات بالسجن مدى الحياة؟ من أين لهن كل هذا الفرح وقد قضينا سنينا هنا؟ لاحظت كيف تبدل الخبث في عينيها إلى حزن عميق ترى هل أدركت في تلك اللحظة أن السجان هو السجين؟ رغم أنه يملك مفاتيح الأبواب الخارجية؟ هل فكرت أنا سجينة هذا المكان والزمان سيأتي يوم ويخرجنا من هنا؟ أما أنا؟ أشاحت بوجهها عنا لألا تفضحها ملامحها تعالت ضحكات البنات أمسكنا بأيادي بعضنا البعض نمت البراعم الجميلة أكثر فأكثر وأزهرت واصلت نموها إلى الأعلى وامتدت وصلت إلى هناك حيث يجب أن تكون حرة مخترقة الشبك So she's talking about the rain, the beauty of being uh, when it's raining, she's there on her own to start with, and she was followed by all the rest of the women prisoners, and how they notice, I mean, the, the questioning about the role of the, uh, the guard, the woman guard there, and how they realized they are free while she is the real prisoner. Uh, in fact, there within herself, because they know one day they'll be free. But does she know what what will happen to her in the future? So questioning about that. And uh, the second book is which been just been released is the Salt Journals or Notebooks, being written also by uh, those are the women who been imprisoned by Bin Ali in Tunisia in the 80s. And I'm working now on the second part, which is uh, about the writing of women who were imprisoned in the 70s. The difference between the two uh, books is this one uh, in the 80s. So the main women prisoners are uh, either religious, wearing the hijab, because of wearing the hijab, or they are actually Islamists. While the second book is going to cover the uh, decade of the 70s were mostly the activists were the communists and left uh, wing women. So these are the two uh, things. <coughs> and I think I'll stop here. And I don't know I, uh, if, if you like to ask questions or? Mm -hmm. Questions maybe? Um. You've probably answered this already, but um, and you've probably been asked this a lot. Um, but as a female author, were you ever pressured or scared or, um, or tempted to change your name to a male or initial with a just a name like J.K. Rowling did, because she um. thought being a female author would no, no, not at all, no, no. no. On the contrary, because I am a female, I think it was good. <laughs> yeah, I no. yeah. yeah, no, I never. I never had any kind of pressure in that sense, no. And, uh... Do you find, <coughs> sorry, do you find the people that you interview, because you're interviewing them about things that have traumatized them as well, do you find that they're quite willing to talk about those really personal details, those human moments that they experienced? Um, or is it quite hard to, op like, to open that conversation, mm. to go back into the past with them, into moments that were really, really mm. hard for them? Mm. I don't interview them 
uh, not at all. Oh, sorry. No, it's just I, I let them write whatever they think. It's their, their, uh, to start with is we spend some time together and they know me and they know of me anyway to start with. So there is kind of uh, trust. Uh, and what's always worked on my, I mean, a benefit for me is being an Iraqi. And uh, whether in Palestine or Tunisia, the minute you say I am an Iraqi or they realize you are an Iraqi, so hooray, it's a fantastic thing. So I have that as a credit even before I open my mouth or do anything. So even if I've been the most horrible person on earth, but <laughs> the, this is a, a deep relationship between the two uh, countries with Iraq. And because in, uh, in Tunisia, they're very grateful. Immediately they tell you that, aha, uh -huh, we studied in our primary schools, books signed present from Iraqi people. So they feel always they are very grateful uh, to this and they carry it within themselves. And also, I'm because I published my memoir, I was written, and so being through the same experience, they immediately, they, uh, they trust you. I mean, you have a certain uh, very good start. You don't have to claim anything. And they encourage them to write, just write, whatever, and we work on it work on that, develop it, or whatever they want. But it is, it's mainly their words. I wanted their words, their writing, their emotion, their everything. And uh, there were moments of tears, crying, remembering, very, really painful for them, trying to remember things, but also the, a lot of laughter. Uh, we shared beautiful moments uh, together. And in Palestine, they, they brought a lot of food, by the way. <laughs> so we had a lot of food together. And that, uh, it, it is trauma. It is very big trauma. And writing is helping them. I think they, and they were very pleased to see it in a book. Very pleased. And the book in Palestine almost developed its own life there. Because they started whenever they went, women, to uh, an event, uh, they organized few events uh, around the country, they started reading their texts themselves. So they are the owner, uh, they themselves own this book. And I've noticed the same thing at the launch of the book in uh, Tunisia. Uh, and they just, it's also nice and kind of, in the Arabic world, you know, a writer is a status you look forward to. And when you see your writing in a book, it's something really very encouraging and almost healing uh, to go, especially if you go and see it as part of the continuity of your struggle. This is it another, I mean, not everybody going to fight anymore or it's different uh, circumstances, but with a book, you can do something, something different. So they've been introduced to using another tool. It's the writing, it's themselves, and their own writing, nobody else. Nancy. Nancy. Uh, thank you very much for reading that. Could you tell me a bit more, tell us a bit more about the process of getting it from that, that instruction of put anything on paper to kind of break down the barrier between the spoken and the written? and then how it went through the editing phases until it came to this. So, um, so kind of how did it transform from the, from the Ami to the Fustha? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, uh, it wasn't exactly Ami altogether. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they have the knowledge of, uh, they, they read. And that's very good. I mean, they, they were all, they, the good thing about them, they loved reading. So that's very good first step to it. So they know what is it. But uh, like uh, what I kept in Hafla Lithaira, even the Hebrew, which been used by the 
the guards in the prisons and all. We kept some of it because these are the words they know about. So we had the footnote in the footnote uh, to explain what it means or whatever. So we introduced even these words which is, became familiar to them all. Between the classic and thing, we re I said simple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Simple Arabic will do for me. Uh, that was more difficult with the Tunisian. Mm -hmm. Uh, because their uh, spoken Arabic is really doesn't mean Arabic at all. <laughs> so I had some of them like uh, training them how to write it in a simple Arabic uh, rather than leave it as it is. Though, I mean, when it is, was necessary and it's very thing and they were thinking because there was discussion about it. They couldn't understand why this is not really, I, I don't understand it. And, or it has sometimes very rude meaning, by the way, certain words they have in another country or for other, uh, absolutely you can't pronounce it, something. For example, when you say, is, I heard them saying, uh, one of the women was saying, well, uh, he's, uh, Yothan, Yothan, uh, and I thought Yothan is okay. I mean, Yothan is the flower when you grind flower. Apparently, Tahan there he is uh, the uh, what is it? The, the man who's with the prostitutes. Yeah, the, uh, gigolo. No, not ah. gigolo. Yeah, uh, no. even worse. Pin. Pin. Exactly, exactly. So, I mean, when I say this word, they get upset. <laughs> and then when they say that, in other words, they got. So we, we reached this uh, medium happy solution of having it, uh, some of the words they insisted, because after all, they are also addressing their Tunisian readership. It's not, I, well, I was thinking of the Arabic in general in other countries. Yeah, so we kept few of the words and we put it down. Uh, the process of editing, uh, I did a lot with them themselves. I mean, it's, uh, uh, and they agreed about it. And we read it time after time after time. Together? Yes, together. together. Together, yeah. We were so what always. What was the first exercise you did with them? No, that was to begin with, it's about uh, breaking the ice or uh, getting comfortable and let's start about the, uh, we sitting here, write something about here. And then we start uh, to emphasize about, about uh, here. here. Yeah. I say, write what something about here. It's 100, 200 words like. And about we start, they start to notice that the place is important, the sound, the senses, all these elements of writing. And uh, they learned, they learned. I think they were keen, they wanted also. In Tunisia, they are really more, uh, uh, because it's not under occupation. And uh, Tunisia is one of the very few Arab countries that they really enjoying now democracy, they enjoying freedom, total freedom. Women are really, they own the streets there, they own the places. And they, uh, so they want to take part and they want to do everything and very enthusiastic. And they still kind like, you don't see it in other Arab countries, they are still ambitious, they have their dreams to achieve things and all, which is almost like when you are young. Mm -hmm. So, women. In Palestine, it's different. I mean, the reality is so heavy, so heavy. You have to seek, to seek hope. Uh, and their hope, I mean, they are, they just by continuing whatever they can do. Yeah. Sarah, another question? Maybe the last question? Oh, like short one. So uh, I'm interested in how you deal with memory when you're writing. So I can imagine that you you can remember something very sp specific things very clearly, and but something are very vague. Some things are very vague. So how do you deal with that when, especially when it comes to something vague in your memory? And but how do you write about that? I, myself, yeah, I have to say that, I mean, in the last, uh, or since the occupation of Iraq, 2003, I haven't written anything uh, literary at all. I couldn't. So, I mean, 
almost I haven't uh, done anything related to memory or otherwise. It's, uh, but uh, I'm working other kind of work. So this kind of uh, project doesn't need me to rely on memory. I'm free of the worry about it for the time being. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, this is a point which I keep talking about while running the workshops, especially they are prisoners. It's the importance of being truthful. And truthful that can be verified, especially, I mean, in Tunisia. Now the book is being used about, uh, as part of the transitional uh, justice. Uh, and it's part of a bigger project uh, the, about voices of women. So it's only one part of many other things. So it's very important about the truth. Uh, and uh, one of the, because some of them still activists, they are activists politically, it could be used against them if they're not truthful. So it's, it's a very important issue for people who are writing this kind, even when it is within like a literary text. Uh, sometimes you mention one thing which is really blaming someone or blaming some party or blaming something. This can be really, really be harmful and damaging to the whole work you've done. So they were very, very careful. As, and I, I've been really checking and checking, and they themselves did that as well. As, yet, yet, one of the critics, and I'm, uh, <laughs> he managed to find a mistake, an error. And uh, it became like something. I mean, error, small, I, I don't know. It's, it's the place of someone who was uh, assassinated. Mm. So that's it became past a big deal. Yeah, well, yeah. he used it in, mm -hmm. in a way, uh, mm -hmm. thing. So it's very important uh, checking. And uh, when there is a project like this, I uh, think no matter how you say this is literary, this is um, uh, about imagination, about poetry, even poetry can be, when it's a political situation, can be really questioned and checked and used sometimes against you. Another. So you have to be extra careful. Did you have in Palestine any issues accessing prisons and were you doing the workshops inside the prison? No, 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 no. They've been uh, muharrarat. They they've been liberated. Those women. No, not inside. No. But uh, now it seems like uh, there is uh, some of them are continuing which is very good news. And uh, the, the piece which I read this uh, May, by May, she is working on her own book, uh, almost finished her book. But also there is another writer who volunteered to carry on the same project because I, I'm not going there. I mean, I'm doing something else. So someone else is continuing. Uh, and I, I think, I think, I mean, we're not changing the world. But definitely it's a very small step, which hopefully will encourage more women to write. It encourages, uh, especially, I mean, those women who have this huge experience, it's no matter how traumatized, how painful, it deserves to be recorded, it deserves to be documented. And it's part of the, overall, it's a national memory, actually how you, you preserve it, how, uh, how you, uh, you, you have to write it down. We have, uh, unfortunately or sadly, uh, not many women writers. I mean, okay, you read now this woman has the Booker Award or prize or another woman, but they are not really real representative of how many women writers or how women writing. It's, it's when you look at the, uh, the population of the Arab world and count how many women writers we have, we feel, my God, what's going on? And th this, is, th th this is the part of the world that invented writing. Mm -hmm. What's happened to them? <laughs> so, there are many reasons for it, but I mean, let's hope 
will be more will have more of writing is very important too very important i mean i'm i'm probably repeating what is everybody knows about it but uh, sometimes we need to repeat it for some reason maybe on that note we can bring this to a conclusion thank you so much haifa it's been fantastic thank you, thank you again